My wife swing, sings with a musical group, uh, Sway. Many of you have you've probably seen them. They sang at Old Timers uh, this last old timers and it's an, a group with an amazing depth of musical talent. So the bass player is a retired band teacher, the piano player has been teaching piano for decades. I mean there's a lot of people with amazing talent and, and my wife uh, who's a band teacher sings and then the other fellow who sings as well some of you may know uh, but you don't know him as a vocalist you know him as a highway patrolman Steve Wilhoit. Hopefully you have not met him in uniform, but uh, that would be a problem. But he, when he's not in uniform, he, he really enjoys performing and, and singing. He was with Olivia in the production of Les Miserables, and he uh, sang Empty Chairs at Empty Tables. Some of you saw that. It's just haunting and powerful. He's a very talented uh, musician. And, and so the band was practicing recently. And they were looking to add some new material. They were singing a wedding uh, reception. And they were looking to add that classic of, of, all, of all wedding receptions, Wonderful Tonight by Eric Clapton. I mean, there's no wedding receptions complete without having that played. It usually was the, uh, it's the last song before everyone goes home, everyone goes out and have one last slow dance, something like that. It's, uh, everyone knows the song. And so they're practicing it. And they're getting the transitions, they're working on it, but Steve isn't, he hasn't, he's not quite nailing it. He's singing it, he's not singing it exactly like Eric Clapton. And if anyone has got the song right, it's Eric Clapton, one of the most talented musicians of the last generation. And so they're try he's trying to get it right, and he's not satisfied with it, and he doesn't want to sing it because he's just not getting it perfect. He's not getting it right. He's not doing it just like Eric Clapton. And my wife, in a moment of frustration just tells him, you know, just sing the song. And, and Steve does as he was told, wise choice, and uh, they, they sang the song. It went over really well. But there's this understandable drive that Steve had to get it right, get it perfect, do it just like it should be, spotless and flawless, and, and, and just be perfect in that. There's this, this word perfect that we're looking at today and there's this, this sense of the word perfect we commonly think of it as something that is flawless, that is without any error, something that's just exactly right, just like Eric Clapton singing Wonderful Tonight. That is that's as perfect as that song could be. A, a, and it can be somewhat intimidating to, to try to, to deal with perfect, especially when you're working with a perfectionist who wants it to be just exactly so. And so, with that in mind, we bring all that baggage to the Bible. We read this verse. That's all right. Yeah, that one. There, Jesus is saying this. He's in, the, he's in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, and he's been telling his disciples and all those following him things like, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I say, turn the other cheek. He, he's, Jesus is saying things like, you have, not, you have heard it said, do not murder. But I'm saying to you, don't even insult your brother or sister. And, and, and the, the disciples are probably sitting there thinking, ooh, that's quite a bit you're asking there. And then he comes to this, and, and he says, be perfect. And, and can you just imagine the disciples sitting there thinking, what did you just say, Jesus? Perfect? Ooh, Perfect. You know, I can't speak for the disciples, but speaking for myself, if I get up in the morning and I manage not to crack the yolk on my egg, I manage not to be too late, and, and, and I mean, if I'm just, if I'm a competent dad, husband, uh, pastor, if I just hold it all together competently, I think I've done pretty good for a day. Perfect. Whew. Perfect is intimidating. I, I don't do... Andy doesn't do perfect. It just doesn't happen. But this is what he says. Be perfect. So what do we make of this? How do we understand this? Today we're going to be looking at how uh, John Wesley helps us to understand this, this passage because he, he would read the Bible and he read it at face value. What, there's, what is being said is what is meant. You need to take it seriously. You can't gloss over it and just skip over what you don't like. That sort of buffet theology, buffet approach to the Bible, you, you preach what you like and the rest you punt on, he, he wasn't for that. You've got to take the whole thing. And so what Wesley did, as is always a good idea, when reading the Bible, is not try to understand just one little verse by itself, 
be perfect, but instead put it in the context of, of a lot of what the Bible says in multiple places about this very same topic. And, and so what I have done is pulled together the other passages in the Bible that use this same word. Is this? So, every time the word perfect shows up, in whatever, however it's been translated, I put it in bold. And so we get things like, and James, let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete. And so there's this idea that perfection is about completion. Again, later in James, you see that faith was working with his, Abraham's work. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected. His commitment, his faith in God was complete and perfected. In Ephesians, uh, God gave some as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. These are the, the jobs in the church. That God gave them these jobs so that they would equip the saints. The other way this shows up in translation is perfecting the saints. Uh, equipping or perfecting the saints for the work of service to do the building up of the body of Christ. Until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man. And so that's that same word again. And so now it's equipped, mature, complete, perfect to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. In Romans, this is how Paul puts it here, do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Whatever God desires, that is what is perfect. In Corinthians, he's writing to a church which is having some struggles, and he says, Brothers and sisters, do not be children in your thinking, yet in evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. Grow up, is what he's getting at here. Per being perfect, complete, equipped. And again in Colossians, we proclaim him, God, admonishing every man and teaching every, um, every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man as complete in Christ. So it, this word, as you see how it's used again and again, it's not quite that perfect as in like spotless, without error. It, it's equipped, it's mature, it's complete. The, the best translation I've come across for this passage actually is from a the translation of the message by Eugene Peterson. He writes, In a word, what I'm saying to you is, grow up. That's how he translates that word. He doesn't write perfect. He says, grow up. Your kingdom subjects now live like it. Live out of your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously towards others the way God lives towards you. And so what we, we th read when we're reading in the New Testament is this idea that when it says perfect... It is not this like errorless, spotless thing that we tend to think of today. Singing uh, Wonderful Tonight just like Eric Clapton. Perfect. It's not that. What it's getting at is this sense of maturity, this sense of completeness, the sense of being equipped. And maturity is something that changes over time, right? It's something that you are more, more mature tomorrow than you were today. And this sense of growing maturity, that to follow Jesus is to grow and mature and become equipped for the doing of God's work day by day, this is one of the, the distinctive aspects of the Methodist church. Most churches are started with an argument about uh, what you believe. Uh, Calvinist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Baptist, Catholic, they're all dif differences in what you believe. The Methodists began not based upon a disagreement about what you believed, but because of the complete and overwhelming indifference of the people of the age when it came to following Jesus. That's what Wesley saw. Com indifference to following Jesus. And, and so a lot of the innovations of, of Methodism are, are practical. We move pastors around. We connect all the churches together. These are not wild theological thoughts. These are just kind of practical things. These are just how do you make a church run better type of things. This is one of the few places that we can say, you know, Wesley is on to something, and this is kind of a new way of putting it. Because what Wesley pointed out was, if Jesus says, be perfect, grow up, then that's what we're meant to do. Day by day, grow up, and, and, and what he calls this is Christian perfection. Who here has heard that term before in a Methodist church, Christian perfection? Excellent. 
There's a reason why, and I'll thought to tell you. But this, this term, Christian perfection, or entire sanctification, it becomes how Wesley talks about that if we are following Jesus, we are, bec- we are mature, we are complete, we are perfect when we are so filled with the love of God and love of neighbor that we would never willingly sin. That's what it means to be perfect. This, this idea that you, when you are so full of the love of God and love of neighbor that you're not choosing to sin anymore. It's kind of a dynamic and moving target though, isn't it? Because as you are growing day by day, what you're capable of when it comes to loving God and loving neighbor grows. You're capable of doing more today than you were 10 years ago. And you'll be even able to be even more graceful, resp- respectful, gracious 10 years from now. Or hopefully tomorrow. And so the idea of, of Christian perfection is that it's a maturity day after day that you're growing as God is working through you and in you. Now there are some caveats to this, obviously. Like, we're never going to know everything. So to be perfect in Christ does not mean you never make mistakes. If you don't know everything, you're going to make mistakes. It doesn't mean that you never... Um, you're not going to grow old. Everyone will grow old. That is a given. And it, we are still in bodies that, that fade and fail over time. But what this is, is the way that Wesley understands salvation to, to be this continuous process in our lives. That God is seeking us out first. And that when we turn to God, that is, our mo- that is justification. That is repentance. That's when we turn to God and our salvation begins. But then when we turn to God, God's not done with us. That we are continually seeking God and God is continually seeking to move in us and through us. And that we are being renewed and transformed, having the mind in us that was in Christ. And this idea of perfection, of sanctification, of being transformed, that's what what he believes uh, Jesus is getting at. This idea of maturity, being as good as you can be for the point at which you are at. Now, to use the word perfection did get Wesley in some trouble because he, for his entire life, he had to struggle with people either saying, you can't be perfect, and Wesley would have to explain, I'm not talking about never making a mistake, I'm saying being so full of love of God and love of neighbor, you're not going to choose to hurt someone. That, that is possible. It might be fleeting, you might have it sometimes, not have it others, but it is possible. And so he, he was either defending it as possible at all, or on the other side, there were times when he was leading the church when... Uh, there were people who would claim to be perfect, and they'd say, well, I'm perfect now, and, and so you can't tell me what to do because I'm perfect. And Wesley would have to point out, the second you claim to be perfect, you're proving you're not, because part of following Jesus is humility, and the second you say I'm perfect, you're showing that you're not humble. So relax, dudes, just, just chill. So he, back and forth, this was an argument throughout his life, but it was always to be able to, to hold on to this central idea that when you are following Jesus day by day, you are growing in maturity and so that tomorrow you are to be more graceful, respectful, honest than you were today. And then the day after that, and then the day after that. And what happened then is because people had such a hard time talking about it, it got misinterpreted so often, we just stopped talking about it, which is why we hit the sad case where a room full of Methodists had never heard the idea of Christian perfection or Wesleyan perfection, which is admittedly kind of sad and that's why we're talking about it today. Because this is an important aspect. This is an important part of our, our tradition. Th- this is the way that we make sense of what happens after you decide to follow Jesus. This is how we make sense of what happens next. Where do you go? What do you do? Why do you bother doing all this church stuff? If turning to Jesus is what gets you saved, what's next? Well, you follow Jesus day by day so that you become the best you that you can be. And so that you can be the most patient you that you can be. And tomorrow, maybe you're a little bit more patient. That you you are the most forgiving today that you can be. That you are the most understanding today that you can be. You're the most humble today that you can be. You're the most giving today that you can be. And tomorrow, you're even more mature. You're even better at doing those things because you are building the base today for getting better at it. That every day that we follow Jesus, we are getting more Christ-like. So that... The, the me that is preaching today, a year from now, if, if it's the same me preaching, that I have failed, that a year from now, I better be more graceful, understanding, and wise, because I've had another year of following Jesus under my belt. I better be more mature. That's part of this whole perfection. It's an ongoing thing over time. It's a never-ending process. 
it, you know, we, we graduate school and we leave all those teachers behind and we think we're done learning. But, but this is the one teacher we never stop learning from. We are always sitting at the feet of Jesus and he is always teaching us how to be more gracious and humble and understanding and graceful. Now notice how much of this has to do with attitude, right? Notice how much of this has to do with your attitude. This is mostly about what, how you approach life, not what you do. Like, I could serve you a meal tomorrow, and, and I might serve you the exact same meal tomorrow that I'd serve you today. Cook, get my cast iron skillet up, cook it up, and give it to you. It is not about whether I cooked it better. That's not Christian perfection. It's was I more gracious and humble and understanding when we sat down at the table together. It's the attitude with which I do these things. And, and that continues throughout my life. There may come a time when I cannot lift my beloved cast iron skillets. I, I hope to God it never comes. But there might be a time when, I mean, God forbid, there might be a time when I cannot cook at all. And the best I can serve you is some McDonald's we go out and grab together. That's not Christian perfection. It's not how good of food do I serve you. It's the attitude with which I serve it. That is what we're talking about. We're talking about Christian perfection. It's, it's being graceful and understanding and patient with each other and being ever more so each and every day. When I was ordained, I was asked questions about this by the bishop in front of every Methodist pastor in the state. They're the same questions that John Wesley asked people he sent out to preach over 300 years ago. And, and the questions he asked and the questions I, I was asked by Bishop Schnazy in front of everyone I was asked are you going on to perfection? And I want to ask you that today. Are you going on to perfection? Do you expect to be made perfect in this life? Are you striving after this perfection each and every day? That's what I was asked. That's what every Methodist preacher has always been asked, and that's what I'm asking you today. Are you striving for perfection? Are you striving to grow up? Are you striving to be more mature tomorrow than you are today? So that when someone sees you tomorrow, they see more of Christ in you than there is today. And if you're not going on to perfection, if you're not earnestly striving to grow in faith, to be more Christ-like tomorrow, if that's not where you're going, then where are you going? Jesus calls each of you to grow up, to be more mature tomorrow than you were today, and then the day after that. To let your attitude, your, your actions reflect Christ in all that you do. So that you are the best you that you can be. Now this might be slightly intimidating to always be improving, always be getting better. But it's something you can do. Because it's something God made you to be able to do. Morris, can you be a better Morris tomorrow than you are today? Pam? Stan? Wayne? Can you be Jennifer? Can, can you be a better Jennifer tomorrow than you are today? And then the day after that, Terrence. Tomorrow, can you be a better Terrence than you are today? You remember Steve? That he's going to watch this. So Steve, you can be a better Steve tomorrow than you are today. Hey. <laughs> That's the call that is placed upon us as disciples of Jesus. Grow up. Tomorrow, be more Christ-like than you are today, and the day after that, be even more so. For by the grace of God, each of us are capable of being transformed. Each of us is capable of being perfect. Thanks be to God. Amen.